Hi, I'm going to give a little bit of a discussion on how I choose paint colours. Um, I've got a number of boxes like this where I've arranged them into the basic shades. I've got my reds box, my blues box, my greens box. They're not all limited to being humbral. Sometimes they revel tins or extra color tins. There was a very nice range. I don't know if anyone knows extra color. Um, I don't. I don't commonly pack the uh, the Tamiya's into the same box. This is sort of my base choice set. Um, So I've got, uh, you know, I've got a big box of greys. I've got my metallics and so on. But I, I'm going to start a little bit earlier. So remember that I said when I started building, I didn't have paints at all for many years. Then when I did start with paints around 1981, at best, I had like one, two, three. I mean, imagine an aircraft in three colors, some of which were gloss. A few years on, and I'm at barely 10 colors. I think by 1986, I couldn't have been more than 20 colors. Some random choice of matte, you know, your, your standard camo colors, a, a medium green brown for doing and and that was perfect all the models that you made at that time you just loved them they had paint on them paint on them and they looked great none of this um you know fancy chrome work or anything like that um i'm sure I'm sure I did just have my gloss yellow I had a brown so this this aeroplane would have been achievable um probably this as well but not sprayed of course because I, I only started spraying much later but um so in the kits and most notably i'm talking about airfix here you had the little little slip with you know five or six or seven um, humbral colors recommended now as a kid with out the recommended paints on hand they they were quite handy so that you at least knew what the what, what the manufacturer was suggesting FX said use this use that fine as a kid that that's great um, and in the pre-internet era and it's very strange to even say that um, to imagine that we were modeling prior to the internet existing, or at least existing in its public common format. Um, we didn't research uh, in the sense of, have I got the right colors? And um, is this going to look exactly the way it should? We just, we, it said this number, you use this number and you built your kit and you were happy with it. As the years went on, I moved up and I had more and more paints. But although I did start doing research, my choice of colors was then and still is now slightly different from your average modeler, I think. I am hardly ever referring and trying to find the exact cockpit color that a particular aircraft was or the exact shades that were recommended in the I, I don't even know what all literatures you know would would dictate the exact shades slightly different when it's German aircraft like the, the those exact RLM colors but I don't build a whole lot of German stuff and I, I I think the only aircraft was my ME109 where I, I tried to be somewhat exact. But on average, the way I'm choosing a color is now now that we've got a bit of internet and um, reference pictures and one's sort of sitting there scanning pictures and you find, oh, that looks very nice. That's the way I want to paint this one. 
is that one the exact way that all of those aircraft were? And I saw one yesterday, a very, very nice Corsair F4U. Now the amount that the paints are weather, weathered and, and uh, sun bleached and, and I mean all sorts of off color panels due to its wall wariness makes a very, very nice picture. And that's what I'm choosing. I'm, I'm sort of looking at the picture, holding up my paints. Oh, that's, that's close. Yep, yep, I'll choose that one. Okay, that's going to look good for that and for the variation. Well, how about that? I, I'm not referencing anything other than a visual choice on what I think will look great. And on occasion, people will say, yeah, well, you haven't chosen exactly the right cockpit color there. Uh, that's that's not even the right blue. Well, I've, I've, I'm, if it's a model where I actually care to match it to reality, I'm matching it to the current visual photo that I'm looking at. Now, of course, photos can be changed by any number of things. Let's just take one example. We're currently in an era where you've got the colorized pictures. And that's just somebody using software to try and adequately re-represent the coloration that would suit a particular black and white war photo. And it doesn't matter if it's, if it's not absolutely perfect. If it looks great and you want to model it that way, choose your paints like that. Um, sometimes I am doing my own choice color schemes and of course then I can choose anything I want and there's no argument. Um, so yeah I don't I don't research the actual color names on aircraft whatsoever. I just have a picture in mind and I select my paints to 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 um, you know either the base color or the the variations or the panels here or the panels there. Um, with the museum trip that I just did you it might have struck you when you when you look at me walking around the, the, the planes there and I get this feeling the planes look a little bit boring and the reason they look a little bit boring is because they've just painted straight up you're not seeing weathered models we are sort of so used to seeing the war pictures and the and building our our, our aircraft with a nice bit of weathering which looks great that's that's the way we like to do them so much so that the, the the museum aircraft actually look bland, with the exception of that Bristol freighter. Because it was so big, they, you know, I think they had to just leave it um, with whatever remaining weathering it had on it, and all the oil and oops, grime and everything under the wings, and that one looked pretty good with its very aged effects, um, even the paint. Um, discoloration and so on. Um, I don't find that looking at some of those aircraft is is mo motivating for a paintwork build. They, they're motivating from the aircraft topic. The Blerio is different because that's you know that's got its um, whatever that covering is um, not quite canvas, but anyway, the material coverings and the, the woodwork and the all the different materials that are used in it. Um, so here and there, that, that, that Sopwith pup that was also quite, you know, that had a lot of a lot of interesting colorations on it um, for reference. And it sort of makes you think how we model by looking at so many other people's models. Although I'm not a fan of the pre-shading. Um, I have my particular 
particular choices of how I weather things, um, a variety of them, uh, depending on the topic. Um, nothing wrong with pre-shading. So for instance, on this little thing, I just started the green camouflage and I haven't gone further with that. Um, that, that very faint um, sort of shadow effect there on the elevator. I haven't done anything on the underside, but you know, I, w I would just have my own my own sort of choices of how I'm how I'm approaching anything at any one point. But it's not really reference to a a a dictated color set. I'm I'm choosing pictures that look nice to me, and that's that. Anyway, that's my ramble on um, on paintwork. I've got um, I've got my shelf here with all of the stuff that's ready for next next color. So this has got two of its colors on. Still needs the third, which was it's been waiting ages for that. Um, this one is close to finish, and this one I chose to do absolutely just just bright. I just wanted one of the Hellcats to be um, nice and bright, no weathering perfect condition which of course it would be for exactly a few days in the war um, I made a mistake on this one which you won't I don't think it's gonna come through and that's another video that I should do is how commonly I still make mistakes the engine I glued in and I can't tell you what I was thinking at the time, but um, I just obviously wasn't paying enough attention. So that the axis is now offset slightly from your um, reference fuselage axis. So I was gluing it into the position locators on the inside of the cowling. But um, it might have only had one on one side and... By the time that it glued and I put it into position, I realized that the engine was in fact offset, but that's that's okay. I, mistakes happen. Okay, till next time. Cheers.